So as you all know, IBM developed Deep Blue in 1996. Deep Blue lost to Gary Kasparov, but they, they did some modifications. And in 1997, as everybody in here knows, they, they beat him. And uh, he wasn't happy about it. Kasparov said they cheated, and that's something we'll talk about. Our first participant in the panel is a computer scientist at IBM's T.J. Watson Research Center. Serious chess competitor with a doctorate in computer science. He was one of the brains behind the development of Deep Blue from the beginning. Please welcome Murray Campbell. <laughs> Murray Campbell, have a seat. And our next participant broke the record as the youngest U.S. national master of chess at the age of 13. He's older than that now. He went on to achieve the rank of grandmaster, won the U.S. championship three times, and was the official grandmaster consultant to the IBM Blue Team. Please welcome Joel Benjamin. Thank you, Joel. Have a seat. We have our water here. So let me, let me start with you, Murray. At what point in the development of Deep Blue did you first see the fetal sonogram? <laughs> Yes, well, we, I never actually got to have a conversation with, with Deep Blue. It was always strictly chess moves, unlike uh, well, that's, the experience we just went that's through. That's actually quite comforting. Um, <laughs> so tell us about uh, your impressions of the movie, what was realistic, what was... <laughs> I think we know what wasn't <laughs> realistic. But what, what rang true to you from your experience? I mean, you did 11 of these tournaments, and you... You and your team and your programming won eight of them. Yeah, so I, when I f first saw this, I said this, it really visually rang true. The uh, director obviously did a, a tremendous amount of work to recreate the feeling of, this was a, probably around 1980, 81 uh, or so. My first event was actually 1985. So uh, a few years after this, but it, it felt true. And then, of course, it got off the tracks a little bit in terms of realism. But uh, the conversations about AI, artificial intelligence, the, the role of computer chess, the military applications were even discussed. All of these things uh, rang very true to me. And as a chess player, what was the feeling back then about computers playing chess? Okay, well, if we're talking about it, um, 1980, th they're actually, uh, at that time, they were starting to have some, some, uh, some decent programs. There was a master level um, program at, at that time uh, called Bell, and I, I played it in a tournament, and it gave me a very unexpectedly difficult game, but then I managed to win because I just sort of maneuvered around and it thought it had the advantage and decided it had to win somehow. So eventually, it did something to worsen its position just to make something happen. And then I was able to take control. Um, but it was, uh, we were just starting to understand that uh, there were some computers that, that could play reasonably well, but there are just a handful of them. Presumably, within a short period after that, the computer wouldn't have fallen for that. Well, they, they started to, to make progress uh, in, in those areas and uh, got steadily, steadily better as the years uh, passed by. So this is pretty obvious, but let's get into some details. What, what did it mean when IBM got into the game? I mean, obviously it changed everything. Well, the, there was a group of graduate students at, at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, which, which I was one, that began sort of on the side, working on uh, computer chess, building machines. And there was a couple of very strong machines that came out of, uh, out of Carnegie Mellon in those days. Uh, both had, at one point or another, won the tournament, uh, the equivalent of the tournament that we just saw in the movie. Um, and by the time uh, the late 80s rolled around, uh, our machine called Deep Thought um, named after the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Deep Thought. <laughs> um, incidentally, for those who don't know, Deep Thought was built to answer the ultimate question, and the answer was 42. 42. <laughs> of course, nobody ever knew what the question was, so uh, it was a difficult challenge. So at this point, Deep Thought became the first computer to defeat a grandmaster in tournament play. And I think this attracted IBM's attention 
they realized this, this was a way to uh, illustrate the progress in technology, the advances in parallel processing supercomputers by building the next generation, and that's started the Deep Blue project. You, you told me before the evening began that there were kind of a a cyclical series of predictions that you know computers would never win. Computers yes. are going to win tomorrow. Computers, no, they're never going to win. And we go back it, and forth. It has been a very interesting how the perceptions have changed over time. So nowadays, everybody thinks, oh yeah, chess is a very easy game because computers are in fact superhuman. Uh, nobody can realistically expect, expect to win a match against a computer. But in the earliest days, in the late 40s, when computers were just getting started, the thought was computers were a grand challenge, that getting a computer to play chess would be fantastic. Even just 10 years later, uh, a Nobel Prize winner, Herb Simon, predicted that a computer would be world champion within 10 years. But then about 10, 12 years later, they were saying, a world champion, that's science fiction. It's never going to happen. And then a few years later, they're saying, yeah, it's within 10 years. And, and pretty soon, by 97, um, you know, 40 years after the first prediction, it finally came true. And Herb Simon was your thesis advisor? He was on my thesis committee, He was yes. on your committee, OK. So 96, uh, Deep Blue at this point is playing Kasparov, and he wins. Yes. What do you do? You bring in Joel, for one thing. And what else do you do? to beef it up so that in 97, you actually win. The point made in the movie was that brute force was an important part of computers. And in the, in the 80s, it definitely was. Brute force was almost everything. The mm -hmm. faster the computer you had, the better it was. And we had an element of that in Deep Blue. We made it much faster than any other computer that was out there. 200 million calculations per, per second. Per second. 200 million chess positions right. per second, which is even more. Um, but we had that, but we had that more or less in, in 96 when we lost. We doubled that speed. Doubling sounds like a lot, but it's not that much. Mm -hmm. You just buy more. Uh, but we also increased the chess knowledge with the help of grandmasters like Joel. We increased the chess knowledge and, and just the general tournament awareness, you know, the opening preparation, things like that, in order to be ready. What did you think when they asked you to come in? Well, the, w the way I got started was kind of interesting because first I came in to play test uh, matches. And I had always been very good playing against computers. Uh, there was an annual uh, competition called the Harvard Cup, which was man versus machine. And I had won it two years in a row. So I thought, OK, this should be fun. You know, I, I was up for the challenge. And I went in there, and I won two games. I won the first game. And then the second game, I could have made a draw any time I wanted. Uh, but I thought, OK, let me squeeze it out. Let me see what I can get. And uh, you know, I, I, I did get the win. And I think I, al I also helped teach them an awful lot about the program. And uh, they realized that uh, you know, it was better to have me on their side. So they offered me this job, which they hadn't mentioned that there was this possibility that to come and train the computer. And I thought, this is a remarkable challenge. He didn't know it was really an audition. Right, uh, yeah, and job interview. The fact that he uh, was so professional about it and, and played it out all the way to the end and showed, uh, gave us the maximum information uh, was uh, a sign that we wanted to have Joel with us. Can you tell us about anything that the, um, the more general audience will actually be able to grasp? Sure. Yeah. Well, my impression was, uh, at that point in computer chess, um, computer programmers were really, they, they were trying, as Murray said, speed, 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 more calculations, the technical things. And it was just kind of accepted that computers would make computer moves. They would make ugly moves. They would fail to understand strategy that not just a grandmaster, but even, let's say, an A-level a uh, human player would understand. Style. They, uh, yeah, computers certainly didn't really have style. They, they didn't have knowledge. And it was, I think it was just sort of accepted. And that was a big difference, that by bringing me in, and my job was really just to play all day long and make observations. And every time I saw something, I said, hmm, this is an ugly move. I would write it down and you know, make these notes, and I'd go to Murray, and we'd 
we talk about it and we see if we could fix it. And when the, when the match actually happened in New York, and there was just so much talk about everything, and the, the thing that we kept hearing was, computers don't do that. We were doing things computers don't do. Well, we did things computers didn't do because we made an attempt to fix them, to change things, and the, the rest of the computer chess community was not prepared for that. You won the U.S. national championship in 97. I did, and that, that was a few months after the match, and there was no question about it. It was because of the work that, that I, I did at IBM, uh -huh. because I was, I was working at chess you know, 40, 40 hours a week, I had you know, good equipment to, to, to work with, and I was so focused, and also, by the end of that experience, I was so hungry to play because I had been doing all that work and very little playing. Yeah. So uh, that actually uh, came back and helped me in a big way. But th there's one interesting point in, in the experience that we had with Joel. Um, there, there's something that's been uh, known in the area of artificial intelligence for, for, for decades, really. It's something called the knowledge bottleneck. And, and, and the idea is that there's all this knowledge in our heads, and if we want to program a computer to perform at a high level in any task, chess or, or anything, um, the idea was get the information out of our head and into the computer. But there's this bottleneck, this funnel, because the languages are so different, it's very difficult to get that knowledge through into the computer and programmed in. And, and certainly when, when Joel first joined us, we had that experience. Joel would say something that, to me, as, as a chess player, I wasn't anywhere near the chess player as, as Joel was, but I was a reasonable player. And it made perfect sense to me, but it wasn't operational. By that, I mean, it isn't anything that we could have turned into computer code. So we had to train Joel to speak more like a computer, <laughs> yeah. in a sense. And, and I think he uh, figured out what he could tell us that was useful and what we, we just throw up our hands and say, we can't do anything about that. And uh, I, I think uh, we changed the way you talked to us throughout <laughs> the course of the, uh, the event. Right. You didn't really expect, uh, with deep thought, and then maybe the, the early Deep Blue, the kind of public reaction that this drew? Well, we actually, uh, full disclosure, we played Deep Thought against Kasparov in 1989 also. And he won very easily yeah. at that point. But it made the front page of the New York Times, it, the fact that we were playing against the world champ. There was a Nova episode uh, on that. So I think that was something, that kind of uh, public fascination with this kind of event uh, um, made IBM pay attention as well. So in 97, when you're playing against Kasparov, something unexpected happens toward the end of the first game of the six-game match. And he wins the game, but the computer did something a little strange. Right. And it seems to have affected the course of the whole rest of the match? Well, that's, that's debatable. Um, I, I think I've, I've told this story to Nate Silver, and it appeared in his book. And uh, since then, uh, Kasparov's spokesperson has, has denied that it affected the match. Uh, who knows? But the story is that at the end of that first game, Deep Blue was losing, as you said. And it was about to make a move, a reasonable move, that would have dragged on the game for perhaps 15 more moves, maybe 20 more moves. And at the last second, for no apparent reason, it played a completely different move, a random move. Like rookie eight. Yeah, it, it was a terrible <laughs> move. Yeah. And uh, we resigned the game immediately. And so the game's over. According to an article that appeared on the internet shortly afterwards, the, the Kasparov team went back to their hotel room and analyzed this position, and, and Kasparov asked the question, how could a computer play a move like that? It's so terrible. And they did this incredibly deep analysis and discovered that if you look deeply enough into the position, every move loses, every move is a force checkmate. And so it was seeing all the way to the end of the game, and 
uh, realized it didn't matter what it played, so it played a random move. So uh, this was pretty far from the truth. It could look a long way, but nowhere near that far. So, so they're seeing a, a, a conspiracy where it well, doesn't they're, exist. They're seeing a, a mm. program that uh, they don't have a good model of how strong it really right, is. Right. And, and that lack of a good model maybe affects decisions later in the match. I, I think it was a fundamental problem that, uh, that they felt they needed to understand everything that happened. Instead right. of, I mean, Kasparov just needed to play chess his handlers needed to kind of get out of the way and let him play. And if he gets, uh, loses his focus, get him back focused again. And for some reason, they didn't do that. Uh, he had a computer expert. I'm sure that Frederick Friedel has seen bugs in the program before. I don't know why he didn't just say, it's, it's a bug. bug. Uh, it, that, that's what most people would do. But for some reason, everything that happened, they, they had to interpret it some way. They had to understand it. And I think that made it impossible for Kasparov to play his best chess. He was just allowing himself to be too distracted. He never really played his normal game. He certainly didn't play his normal game. Um, he claimed that he had felt he had to play this way because he couldn't uh, predict the way that, that uh, Deep Blue was going to play, which sounds fair to me. If he's playing against a human, he's, he's going to get surprises too. Um, but he felt that this, this sort of anti-computer strategy was the right way to go, and it, it worked on, in, in some places and didn't work in, in some other places, and that was, that was kind of the bed that he made to lie in. And, and allegedly uh, at some point he thought, because he knew you were on the team, he thought he might be playing you and it was a, it was a Turk situation. No, Possibly. no, it, it, it didn't have anything to do with me. It, it was back to the point I said before. Mm -hmm. Everything had to be understood. Right. And uh, their team was thinking two things at the same time. Uh, a, a computer, there are these things computers can't do, and there are these things that they, they always get right. And if they get them, get them wrong, then, that, then that's suspicious. So when it did good things it wasn't supposed to do, or did bad things it wasn't supposed to do. It was suspicious. Basically, every move that Deep Blue made was to them suspicious. So it was almost impossible to get through a match with, with, without, uh, so they're, without they're getting in a off. So they're paranoid like state throughout the match. Well, so to be right. fair, though, uh, Kasparov's uh, approach to the match, I, I think if you asked any grandmaster today, nowadays, with computers being so strong, how would you approach playing a computer I don't think they would uh, approach it by playing their normal pl chess. I think they would get just wiped off the board. They would try and play an anti-computer style as best they could. And I know Joel has had experience trying to do this as well. And, and uh, I think it's a reasonable, it was a reasonable decision to play anti-computer. Maybe it was wrong, maybe it was right, but mm. I think it was a reasonable decision. Okay. So he wins the first game, Deep Blue wins game two. The next three games are draws. And then it's the last game of the match, and the match is on the line, and it's a very fast game. Yeah, we we've have many theories about what, what happened that game. I think the, the most frequently uh, quoted theory is that um, the Kasparov team had decided that computers of the day uh, didn't handle a certain opening very well, and that probably Deep Blue will not be able to handle that opening very well. And, and so it was played. It's an incredibly risky opening. It was an opening you would not play. Uh, in, in a, uh, Kaspar would never think about playing against another person. And uh, in fact, Deep Blue handled it extraordinarily well. I, I think, as far as I could tell, it played perfectly in that game. And and, and we, we actually, I can't say that we anticipated that, that opening, but in our preparation, we tried to, uh, to, to plug into, in as many moves uh, as, as we could think of that we, were, we felt uh, solid about. Um, we could program it to play um, certain moves in the opening beforehand. So in this particular opening, this Karo Khan, uh, we basically put in, OK, if it plays this, we make this knight sacrifice. And then I put in like more, one or two more moves. And I said, OK, it can handle it from there. 
So it played, it, play, it shot out the night sacrifice instantly because that was pre-programmed, not because we actually thought that was gonna happen, we were just you know, tying up loose ends. So we put that move in, which maybe it was a shock that it came so fast, and, but then it was playing on its own right after that. And within two moves, it understood that it had a clear advantage. So it was already way above all the other computer programs that didn't understand the position at all. How do you know that it knows it has a oh, clear because advantage? It, it, well, because it, it, it shows the evaluation. Right. As, Remember in the movie, they were yeah. asking, he was asking, can I can see I, the can evaluation? Can I see that? Can I see that? No, yeah. That's, you know. yeah. yeah, we would have the evaluation. We would have that information. So that after each monitor. move, you have a percentage of your likelihood of... Being well, it just bas or? basically it just gives a number, uh -huh. and roughly speaking, uh, you know, like one point is a pawn. So it's it it thought it was like the equivalent of two pawns up, uh, even when it was technically speaking down a knight. Mm -hmm. So it it uh, understood, if you will, it started off closer to the, equal and moved up. Yeah, to equal, but yeah. but pretty quickly, yep. it it uh, it felt. Uh, if, we, if I can use that word, that it, it had a very good position. <laughs> Better not use that word after yeah, watching that movie. Yeah, it's tough to find exactly the right verbs to use for a computer. So the, the match is just over an hour, and he resigns when... In a very surreal way, by the way. He, 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 he stood up and started talking to, to his mother. Was she there? Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> that would be worse, yeah. Yeah. So... <laughs> that's, a, that's encouraging. So, um, he, ordinarily, he would have drawn that game, right? Well, did he have a position that... No, no, no? He, he, no he, he never, because he, he did this, uh, this, this, uh, okay. this gamble right out of the open. Oh, okay, I'm yeah. thinking of a different game. Okay. Now, it, now, if he had played to steer the game into a draw... Um, and made it, you know, it would have been a drawn match if that had happened, then obviously history would have been very different. Right. Um, what do you think the effect was on him to be the first human to, uh, you know, the first world champion to lose? Well, to for one computer? thing, he went on to set a new ratings record and, became, and retained his world championship for several years so after clearly that. Clearly, he was severely damaged. Yeah. <laughs> he, you know, he, he, uh, he, he took it hard, but, uh, you know, he always had a remarkable uh, resiliency. He could bounce back from things. He was, um, whatever other experience we had with him, he was incredibly good chess player, just remarkably talented. So yeah, he went on to you know, bigger and better things. Uh, um, and uh, you know, this will not be the, <laughs> the only thing that he's remembered for. No, the, the youngest world champion, uh, mm -hmm. holding the world championship title for many, many years. So let's talk about the legacy of Deep Blue. Deep Blue was retired. He's on a stud farm somewhere in Kentucky. <laughs> the Smithsonian, actually. The Smithsonian, right. <laughs> and, um, Watson was the next big, the computer that played Jeopardy, was the next big artificial intelligence public display. Yes. What did Deep Blue contribute to that? Because it's a whole different set of problems. It is. Uh, you I didn't think, work on Watson directly. I didn't work directly on Watson. I, I think it's it's the next stage in the, in the progression of, of advancing the area of artificial intelligence. Deep Blue played a game of chess, which is, as they were saying, 64 squares, somewhat limited in that sense, even though there's uh, a, a, an astronomical number of possible games, it's all very constrained. You, you know what moves are possible, you know what the goal is. When you get to a game like Jeopardy, you've opened it up to all of human language. And, and uh, it's not just simple, straightforward questions, but, but puns and, and jokes and, and all of the, the quirks of human language. So being able to deal with language was the next, next level uh, beyond. I think, uh, in a way, Deep Blue is giving a preview uh, of what we're going to see in, in many other fields over the, the coming decades as computers start off laughably bad and they get better and better. You can see that in, this, um, in, the, in the movie that the master who played at the end was very smug and superior about his attitude and he, not so smug towards the end. Mm. But 
I think I saw that through all the levels of players. The players would say, at, say at the expert level, oh well, computers can beat the A class players, but they'll never beat the experts. And then they beat the experts, <laughs> yeah. and the masters say, well, they can beat them, but they can't beat me. And went all the way on to Kasparov, and now everybody acknowledges that they are uh, super uh, superhuman. Um, the question is, you know. The, what I mentioned before, the knowledge bottleneck, now that they're superhuman, how do they teach us? How can we learn from them? And I think that's a pretty much unsolved problem, and we'll be seeing that in these other areas where programs get stronger and stronger at solving particular kinds of problems. How do they get the information, the knowledge, back to the human beings? It's quite an interesting and difficult problem. From uh, you know, the molecular biology question of protein folding, I mean, that's really interesting. If the computers can figure it out and then show the, the molecular biologists what they're doing, I mean, it yes. opens up a whole new dimension in For biomedicine. Drug design, yes, right, yes exactly. absolutely, yes. So what are you both up to now? I'm uh, still a research scientist at, at IBM. I'm looking at problems in what we're calling smarter workforce. That's understanding all the factors that go into the people in a workforce and, and using the analytics, the analysis type approaches that we're, we're looking at here to get people working together more collaboratively, more efficiently, taking advantage of all the new data about people on social networks. So it's, uh, the goal is to just make people more collaborative. I'm, I'm mostly uh, teaching chess uh, in uh, schools and private students. Uh, I'm married and I have two young children, four and two, so that takes up a lot of my time and consequently I don't get to play much anymore. But uh, um, last month I got to play in the U.S. Championship for the 26th time, and that's, that is a record. And I, <laughs> and I, 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 managed to, I managed to tie for sixth out of the field of 24. And I looked around and I noticed that this year I was the fourth oldest player in the field <laughs> after you know, so many years being one of the youngest players. So now, as one of the old players, I showed, OK, I know I still, I still got it, I can still play. So I'm, I think I'm going to keep trying to play at least a little bit for as long as I can. And next year, you're eligible to play senior level. <laughs> Believe it or not, yet because in chess, senior is, is defined as 50. So as the I'm looking for the senior <laughs> title, yeah. And uh, your mother is in the senior tournament currently? Uh, yeah, well, she took a bye to come here because she, she's, yeah. she's uh, oh, there she <laughs> is. out there. And, so um, <laughs> you, you can end the way Kasparov ended. <laughs> yeah. They Talk cheated me, Bobby. <laughs> 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 well, let's, let's give a big round of. Applause to thank, thank you. Murray Campbell and Joel Benjamin. Thank, thank you very much. Good night.